I'd like to welcome Chris to the podium and he'll tell you all about suspensions in your four-wheel drive. Firstly, thank you very much for welcoming us here tonight and inviting us. Uh, my name is Chris Kelly. I'm the state manager for Dobinson Springs and Suspension. And I have my uh, colleague here, Michael, and it's wonderful to be here tonight. What I thought we'd do is um, just glance over the history of the company and our foundations and where we've begun. It is quite a fascinating story and hopefully you find it interesting. After that, I'm just going to go into quickly just the products that we do, how we make the products without getting too technical. All right, so this is our head office. Now, our head office is in Rockhampton in Queensland. The Dobinsons, we are a third generation company now. The Dobinsons family started and still run and most likely forever will still run the company. Uh, they're very, very proud of their beginnings and where they are right now. So the company was founded in 1953 by a gentleman by the name of Reg Dobinson. Now, Reg was um, an apprentice boilermaker for Queensland Rail. And he had a little bit of a reputation for being able to make a good leaf spring. Uh, word got out pretty quickly. And Reg found himself doing, you know, the great Australian cashy on the weekend. Got quite busy. Was very well known. So Reg thought, well, why don't we give this a go? So he... Um, he purchased an old World War II factory in Rockhampton and started Dobinson's Welding Works. Now, as I said, he got very, very busy and Reg was very good at what he was doing. He's a very good blacksmith. So we thought, well, we're going to give this a good run. At the same time when Reg was making leaf springs, he decided that he needed a better and faster way of doing it. So he envisaged a machine that would roll the eye of the leaf spring. Now, Post-World War II, things were not really accessible. Reg worked out that there's some old Spitfire warplanes lying around Rockhampton. What if he could rob some bits and pieces off that? And he did, and he made a prototype and made this machine that we see right there, and that machine rolls the eye of the leaf spring. The prototype was quite successful, and it, the world got wind of it, and Reg all of a sudden had it painted and was selling it to the world. People were buying this machine from England, from Italy, all to speed things up. Now, Reg had um, a couple of boys that were also very interested in the business as well. So we've got Glenn. Glenn is on the right-hand side of Reg there in the middle, and we've got Keith. You could see that they were sitting there with some of their leaf springs that they made. Now, Reg, uh, Reg grew on a little bit, so the boys came up and thought they'd take over the business. They ended up buying the business off Reg, and they started manufacturing lease springs, basically for the trucking industry. They got quite well known there as well, and they started to branch out and started to deal internationally. Yep. And as you can see, so these are some of the, the early lease springs that they made, predominantly for trucks. They were very big in the trucking industry. But what happened then is trucks moved to having airbag suspension. So we had to think outside of the box once more. There's some more leaf springs that we do. Yep. We were buying cool springs from other manufacturers and we thought, well, this is no good. So if we can do what we've done today, then why can't we manufacture them ourselves? So we did. Yep. Fast forward now to the third generation. Uh, there's now five of the children running the company. We have expanded the company now to four and a half acres worth of factories and manufacturing in Rockhampton still. Um, we're exporting to 85 countries, five locations. So we've got a branch in Melbourne, obviously, Brisbane, Sydney, um, Adelaide, and we've got a good distributor in WA. We've also got Dobinson's own stores in uh, Dubai. Florida, and there's another one in South America somewhere, I can't remember. Yeah. Yep. The next progressive step was to get into shock absorbers. So we started making our own shock absorbers. Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to go through the types of shock absorbers that we offer, not get too technical, but I'm just going to go into their function, their form, and how they work rather quickly. This is a twin tube shock absorber. This shock absorber is found on 95% of vehicles. It's what your car had when it came out. It's the cheapest and easiest to manufacture. The way it works is it has two tubes. Oil passes through the foot valve and back up the side where the gas chamber is. It's a very good shock absorber, but it has its limitations. The limitations is it gets hot. 
once the oil heats up, it cavitates and it fades. So then we brought in the monotube shock absorber. The monotube is completely full of oil. It has less chance of fading, less chance of cavitation, and it's great for those corrugated roads that we all love to explore. Yep. Then we've got one step above as well, which is the monotube remote reservoir. This shock absorber is adjustable in the valving. What that means is we can go soft. We can go medium, we can go hard, we can dial it in just like a race car to exactly what we require at any given moment. So if you're going on a long desert trip, you can dial it in for that. If you're just using it around town, you can back it off and dial it in for asphalt roads. Yep. As I said, we manufacture our own products still in Rockhampton. So what we're going to do right now, we're just going to through a really quick process of how we manufacture coil springs. What you're seeing just there is a furnace. So we have the wire, which is the core wire, which goes into the furnace at 1400 degrees Celsius. And then it moves on to what we call a mandrel, where it's, yep. where it's hot wound on the mandrel. Now that's computer controlled. We've dialed in exactly what we need. We have over 20,000 part numbers. We're dialing the part number that's preloaded in the computer and the computer winds it to that. Just a quick video here of the process. As you can see, the wires rolling onto the mandrel. I think this might even be a Land Cruiser front spring by the looks of it. Goes into the quenching where it puts some strength back into the coil. And then we have shot peening, which puts some more strength back into the coil. A gentleman asked me here before, why do coil springs break? It's because they're not strong enough, basically. We have four different processes that coil spring goes through to put that strength back into the metal. And then what we do is we have what's called scragging. So we get the coil and we press it down until it's bound up completely and then release the pressure and measure that coil. If that coil is exactly what we need it to be, then it's a good coil, it's right to go. If it's not, it goes in the bin, we start again. And then we go through powder coating. Now our powder coating factory runs the whole length of our factory. If you look above in our factory, there's just coils going left, right and center going all through the powder coating line. The problem with this process is it's very labor intensive. A good person can make about 350 calls a day. That's it. Staff are very hard to find in Rockhampton and it's, excuse my language, terribly hot. Now we've got 32 degree days with 100% humidity in front of a 1400 degree furnace. No, thank you. Not at all. So we started to look, okay, what do we need to do to meet the demand as the company grows? So we became the first company in the Southern Hemisphere to invest in a cold winding machine. What that does, it winds the coil without any heat. So like I said, 350 coils a day we can make hot. Just a, uh, it's about a two minute video here, but just see if you can go through it. Now we invested $1.75 million into this machine. The first people in the Southern Hemisphere to have it. Uh, just have a look at what it can do. The thickness of that wire that you're seeing there is probably about 24 millimetres. So the fact that the machine can just punch it off like that, is fairly impressive. So the wire comes in, what we call the wire, comes in coils, that if the coil were to unravel, it would reach out for two kilometres. So that's fed into the machine. The machine pushes it through up against what's the mandrel there, and it doesn't actually coil it, it bends it around, and then the roll will form it into what we want. And that is also pre-programmed in, so we can do one car, and then another car, then another car. Now, I won't play the complete video because it goes for two minutes, but I did count how many coils that machine made in two minutes, and it was 15 coils. 
that we can make about 1,750 coils a day just out of that one machine. And that helps us meet the demand that our customers need and require. Quite a different process for that. It's not so labor intensive. So the coil goes through the machine and then it's heated up again to 400 degrees and then it's shot peened and then it's scragged and then it's powder coated and it goes out with a different makeup to the steel. It's more aluminum in that steel, so. So that's the process of how Dobinsons make their products, basically. Now, that's all well and good, but what the most important thing is, is the questions as a company that we ask our customers. And now what I've found after being in this industry for over 30 years is when the customer comes in to see someone, they're not being asked the correct questions. They're being given a product or a solution that is not particularly right for their needs. So we ask the following questions. What do you use the vehicle for? That's the most important thing to ask. What person A you use the vehicle for is completely different to person B and person C. What accessories do you have on the vehicle? Because that, de that determines what parts we use. How much weight do you carry 90% of the time? Quite often in this industry, we'll have people say, well, I need a 500 kilo spring. Okay, why do you need that? Because I go camping every Easter. So what are you going to do the other 90% of the time when you don't have 500 kilos on there? And they get a vehicle that rides too hard. So what I'm trying to say is we try and set the vehicle up for the customer right the first time. And they get the enjoyment out of it. And the feedback from our customers is it's set up right, and it's set up reliably, and we can use it for what we want to use it for. And the next most important question is, what do you want the vehicle to do in the future? What are your plans? And we'll try and factor that into it as well. We find that when we ask these questions, we can give our customers the right kit at the right time, and we'll see them again in a thousand Ks for an initial checkover. And to be honest, the next time we see our customers is when they buy a new vehicle. And that's the way we like to do it. So what I'll do right now, I'll just open for a few questions if you like. See if there's any questions from the people in the room or there's any questions from anyone online. Yeah, certainly. Shop painting is basically sandblasting the piece of metal with a, with a ballast material that changes the molecular strength of the steel and brings it back into what we need it to be again. Scragging is when the coil is this high and then we put it in a hydraulic press and we push it down again until it's to the cause of what we call binding. They're bound up. Then we release that pressure and we check the height, make sure the height is in, within spec. If a coil is no good, it's going to fail at scragging time. Sure, do we want to talk about GBMs? <laughs> a little, not too much. Okay. Part of my role at Dobbins is I'm the GBM engineer. So I engineer the programs from start to finish. When the 300 series came out, I had a vehicle. I drove it for nine hours, assessed it, and then did all the testing program, all the submission, worked out what our customers want, what they would think they're going to need, and then we have a kit that we supply to market if it's approved by the government, which it will be. So do we do GVMs? That's a question. Yeah, I mean, we do. But we don't do GVMs on every vehicle. We want to do the GVMs on the vehicles that we're going to get a return on, basically. At the end of the day, it is business, but yeah. Yeah. So we focus our GVMs on the popular ones. The Toyota, the whole suite of the 70 series, the Hilux, uh, the Land Cruisers. Now we go into the Rangers, that sort of thing. But we do our GVMs differently to other companies do it, where... The three shock absorbers that you've seen, you can get those in our GVM kit. So if you've just got a work vehicle, you can get the twin tube shocks. If you've got a touring vehicle, we'll set you up with our monotube. If you want all the bells and whistles, we'll set you up with our remote res. So we can give you options. So a gentleman asked me before, was concerned about getting a high GVM upgrade because he want, didn't want it to ride hard. We have solutions where the vehicle doesn't have to be oversprung, so it's not going to ride hard. We have a question uh, online. Uh, looking at upgrading springs, sorry, this is from Lee Burns. Looking at upgrading springs on the rear suspension of the hundreds, I have 200 kilograms ATM spare payload, which I'll be maxing out in future with a rear dual tyre carrier. Am I better off having a heavier coil 
write off or adding airbags instead? Uh, that was Lee, was it? Yeah, good question, Lee. It's a little bit of a balancing act when, you know, we're going to ask you, okay, when are you going to put the rear bar on? But the thing is the rear bar weighs 80 kilos, but when it's on the vehicle, because it's so far back from the axle, it actually weighs, you can times that by about 1.5 with leverage ratios. I won't get too technical with it. Simple question is, if you're going to do the rear bar soon, upgrade the rear springs. If you're not going to do it or you don't know when you're going to do it, maybe some airbags might be a good option. But we always like to get the spring to do the work and the airbags are a helper. They're an assist. Airbags are not a final solution. Some people use airbags for a final solution and that's when you hear the horror stories out there. We don't offer airbags in that capacity. Yes, we sell airbags, but always with a spring upgrade as well. Miss Gary? Okay, I had an 80 series at one time and I got uh, progressive rate coils yep. put on the uh, on the rear. So do you make those as well or what do you we think do. of them? We do, yeah. I'll just a quick explanation what a progressive rate spoil is, coil is, sorry. If you looked at the coil springs in the videos there, they're quite what we call linear. It has the same distance between the windings throughout the coil. Progressive is closer up top and then it gets further down the bottom. Now, what that is designed to do is when the vehicle is unladen, it's using the comfortable part of the coil. When the vehicle is laden, it's using the heavier part of the coil. So, yes, we do it on progressive spring, yes. Yeah, they work pretty well for me. Yeah, they're good in the right application. Toyotas have always been, the Land Cruiser has always been exceptional with a progressive road coil in the back. Real good. I've got a, a quick question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Monotube versus uh, remote res. Sure. When, at what stage should you be progressively looking from the monotube to a remote res for a touring vehicle? Absolutely. Two reasons. If you want the adjustability, first reason. You want to be able to adjust the valving between soft, hard. Our monotube shock is none like anything else on the market where it actually has three stages of adjustment, high speed, low speed, and it's got some rebound as well, which is another whole story. But um, so if you were to tell me that I'm going on a lot of desert trips, I'm going to do a lot of corrugated roads, monotube is probably a good idea. The remote res is probably a good idea. It's got the extra wall capacity in it, in the reservoir, and it's... Way less, yeah. Sorry, less, less likely to yeah, fade. Yeah, yeah. More oil means less likely to fade. Okay. That's right. The way a monotube works is as well, it's got a floating piston inside and there's a nitrogen gas pressure behind that. So if the shock does start to fade, it pushes the air straight out again. Yeah. Beauty, thanks very much. Cool. Does anyone else have another question? Oh, you most certainly can, Gary, but you're second in line. I hate to break it to you, mate. So, sorry, could I just pop through here? No, probably not. Okay. Chris, I wonder um, what the warranty is on your uh, springs and shockers. Sure. Our warranty is two year, unlimited kilometres. So if you can do a million kilometres in two years, it's still under warranty. Fantastic. Okay, so would that be um, full replacement warranty or? Full replacement warranty. What, yeah. parts and labour, would it or what? If it's done with us, it's yeah. labour as well, yep. Yeah. Um, with some of our monotube shocks that are all hand built, I did mention that before, they are repairable, they are rebuildable. So we'll make the decision whether we replace it or we repair the shock, depending on the failure. Okay, so what stocks do you carry around Australia, say, um, <clears throat> for whatever somebody might have in their vehicle? Yeah, sure. I had a customer who was Alice, in Alice Springs before I had a distributor in Alice Springs and he had a failure. He had a replacement shock within three days in Alice Springs. Um, we have branches all around Australia that carry a lot of stock. In Melbourne, I try now because of COVID. Before COVID, I was carrying probably maybe six weeks worth of stock. I'm now carrying 12 months worth of stock. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Beauty, thanks very much. And if you get the experience like I have with the ones in the Zook, you won't need to call on the warranty. <laughs> warranty is one of those things. At the end of the day, they're a man-made product. We don't have a 100% success rate. We have the occasional warranty. When I say occasional, one every few months, if that. So, yeah. And being a 70 series, and I know all about leaf springs. So uh, can you explain to me what the difference is between normal leaves and parabolic leaves? Sure, absolutely, yep. A normal, what they call semi-ecliptic, so semi-ecliptic leaf spring, laminated leaf spring has 
a number of leaf springs in the pack of the same thickness but varying lengths. And how that works is when the spring goes up and down through its thing, um, the, the leaf springs move against each other and they create friction, which oscillates and holds up your ride. When you've got a parabolic spring, you've got what is essentially a tapered leaf. So it may go from 12 mil down to eight mil on the end and there's a gap between as well. So you're using the stronger part of the steel when it's laden and the lighter the part of the steel when it's unladen. So that motion transfers through the leaf. Parabolic springs are becoming more and more of a thing in uh, commercial vehicles. They were originally truck technology, but they're out there. We have done some back-to-back -back testing and the parabolic springs typically have the same rate as a semi-ecliptic spring. So they're very similar. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Cool. Thanks very much. Um, anyone, have we got a question down the back there? Chris, I saw a DVD video on YouTube with Tim Bates. Not me. It just won't go away, that thing, will it? <laughs> It was in regards to like the monoshocks and the resis mm -hmm. yep. refurbishment because he had his refurbished. He did, yeah. So what's the lifespan? We've got them on ours. So what would the lifespan be? It's a really good question, Chris. So your typical shock absorber, they say you should replace every 70,000 Ks. I think that's a little bit light on. I think our monotube shocks should probably be serviced, and I'll use the word service, about eight, every 100,000 Ks. And what that service means is new oil, new seals. As long as the components are still in good order, then the shock can be right to go again. Um, usually a day. Yeah. A gas shock or a monotube? A monotube. Uh, it's about $180. Mm hmm Three hundred and about three forty, yeah, yeah. So it's worth it. It's about, you know a little less than half the price. Chris, would the monoshock oil be the same, or the oil reserve? Would that be the same? Yes. For length of time. Yep. Yeah. As long as it doesn't need hoses and stuff like that, you know, components. I. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've got a few more on Q and A. Uh, David wants to know what is your view on the parabolic springs. I think you covered that one. Just quickly, David, on that one. Um, parabolic springs have the same rating as a normal semi-ecliptic. I find a normal semi-ecliptic is to be um, how do I term this? You will get a lot more time out of a semi-ecliptic spring than you will a parabolic. Okay, uh, Matt Lilly's also got a question. Uh, can the remote res shocks be rebuilt when needed? Yes, they can. And we've got another one here from Stephen. Uh, is there a difference in quality between hot and cold spring manufacturing process? No difference in quality. No, interesting thing is when we first started making the cold rolled springs, because we always like to do research and development, as I mentioned, when you do the cold roll, you have to do another two or three tempering um, jobs. We did the first one and we thought, okay, what's going to happen if we don't temper this spring? So we didn't temper it. We went out the next day and the spring was actually split in half. So it definitely needs that. Quality-wise, no, there's no difference in quality. The um, cold rolled spring is actually lighter. So when it comes to unsprung weight, it is more favourable. Anything else? Cool. Thank you very much for your time.